afternoon and welcome to session one of Inviting Biodiversity into Our Gardens and Beyond. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation, Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. The Land Conservancy is Ohio's largest land trust and to date has protected more than 70,000 acres of natural lands, family farms and urban green spaces. At the Land Conservancy, I plan nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages. Our goal is to provide a platform to learn and develop a greater appreciation of our natural world. I am pleased to continue our collaboration with the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium and Nature Spark to bring you this five-part symposium. Through this collaboration, we hope to have an impact in transforming gardens and green spaces into functioning, diverse, beneficial habitats. My co-hosts, Anne Cicerella and Judy Semrock, are passionate about this topic. Anne is the founder of the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium. She works to build connections and inspire conversations about the importance of restoring our fragmented native habitats, starting with our own backyards and local community gardens. Judy possesses a wealth of knowledge about our natural world. Through her company, Nature Spark, she works with children and adults in the realm of nature education and exploration. Judy loves to share her nature knowledge through field trips and public programs, both virtually and in person. I thank them both for sponsoring and planning this series with me. I'm also excited to moderate this series, which features national and regional experts to increase our collective awareness about pollinators, native plants, and planting designs. We hope you will stay engaged and join us over the coming weeks as we offer additional sessions to help us garden with a purpose. Our next session is February 29th. We'll be focusing on our forests with presentations on the American chestnut and old growth forest systems. I'll drop a link to registration for that session in the chat today. Now I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank our sponsors who have made it possible for us to offer this symposium for free. Making this event free is important to us and we can't do it without the support of our partners. Thank you to the Ohio Division of Wildlife, Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, Avonlea Gardens, Biodiversity and Landscape Design, the Cuyahoga Soil Water Conservation District, the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership, Leaves for Wildlife, Meadow City Nursery, Natives in Harmony, and Ohio Prairie Nursery. And remember, please use the Q&A feature to post your questions. We'll pause for a few questions if time permits following each presentation. Now on to our show. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Dilley. Mark is a professional wetland scientist and ecologist at Mad Scientist. Today he will present the importance of wetlands and why we need to save them. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Renee. I'm happy to be here. Happy for the invitation. Great. Let me get this uh, sure. queued up here. All right. Looks great. Is that showing up for you? Yes. All right. Um, Okay, well, I'm gonna be talking on the importance of wetlands today. And I want to thank our botanist um, and one of our project scientists, uh, Jenny Adkins, who put together a number of these slides for a, a different talk. I kind of repurposed it a bit. I also want to thank my wife, Chris, and our CEO for helping uh, build a business and a life together and our entire team here at Mad Scientist Associates for helping us make a difference in the world. This is our business. Um, we do ecological and wet consulting and we're based out of Westerville, Ohio. Um, do pretty much anything related to um, ecological surveys and um, wetland restoration, um, site assessments, that sort of thing. We recently added a service um, so that we can do controlled uh, prescribed fire, controlled burns on projects, which we're pretty excited about. And we're all about making a difference uh, through science, service, and education. 
My wife and I are also part owners of uh, Sayota Gardens, a native plant nursery located in Delaware County. And native plants are one of my passions, um, trying to encourage people to uh, incorporate uh, native plants into their landscapes is um, definitely something that we're very, very interested in. And uh, a lot of my trips coming home from the nursery, my vehicle looks like this. Um, I've been loading up my yard. I've got over 120 species of, of native plants in the yard now, and I just keep finding more things that interest me um, to add to the landscape. So we often are asked about um, what the uh, typical day in the life of a mad scientist is like. So we threw in this slide. This actually isn't a typical day, but we decided to have some fun when we hit the 20 year mark with a um, anniversary celebration that was Halloween themed and we kind of played up the mad scientist um, theme there. This is more typical. Um, being out in the field, collecting data, um, educating the public. Every once in a while, we take some time off for fun. Uh, we have an annual kayak outing that's shown in the lower right there. But what I want to talk to you about today is the importance of wetlands. I hope to impress on you in this presentation that wetlands are good for solving a lot of environmental problems and the environmental and therefore human problems. Um, if you've seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, you may remember this line, put some Windex on it. In an NPR interview, the director of the National Association of Wetland Managers, Marla Stelk, changed it up a bit <clears throat> as she made a similar case for the importance of wetlands. Put some wetland on it. Wetlands are good in a variety of contexts to solve a variety of problems. So what is a wetland? Here's the most basic definition. I imagine that some on today's um, call here are seasoned enough to remember the electric company TV show. Maybe that looks familiar. Um, wetlands are lands that are wet, simply put. Generally, if your rear end gets wet when you sit down in an area after the morning dew has burned off and assuming it hasn't rained in a few days, you may very well be in a wetland. The Army Corps of Engineers uses a more scientific definition that requires the presence of wetland hydrology, um, hydric or wetland soils, and water loving plants that we refer to as hydrophytes. So here's some examples. Um, this is a nice um, forested vernal pool, a marsh, wet woods, a deeper marsh, pond-like um, setting. So I want to give you an overview of, of wetlands in Ohio. And yes, we do have wetlands in Ohio. They're not just in the Everglades. These include emergent um, marsh habitats. These are areas that form over mineral soils and they have uh, vegetation that grows up through the water surface um, and emerges out of the water, hence the term emergent marsh or emergent vegetation. We have areas that are a little bit more marginal in their hydrology, maybe just seasonally saturated or inundated that can form as wet meadows or wet prairies. Where we have um, standing water and shrubs, we, we can see the formation of scrub shrub wetlands. In forests um, and, and bottomland areas along streams, we often get wet woods that uh, flood periodically. Oftentimes the water depths are fairly shallow, just inches of water for extended periods. But often nestled within these settings of wet woods and bottomland forests, we have a unique class of 
wetlands that we refer to as vernal pools. Um, the photos shown here are um, a vernal pool uh, in late season. I think that was probably August um, versus uh, uh, maybe a March photo on the right. And vernal pools have a very seasonal hydrology. They're flooded in the spring. They dry out later in the year. And because of that intermittent drying, they're among our most vulnerable category of wetlands. A lot of people won't recognize them as wetlands if they venture into these environments um, later in the summer when things have dried up. But they're very important and crucial habitats for a lot of different wildlife. And maintaining biological diversity in this state is going to require that we pay attention to uh, these special features of vernal pools. These are some calling chorus frogs and wood frogs in a vernal pool in Ohio. Um, I wanted to uh, take a moment to promote a program that we're organizing um, for the Ohio Wetlands Association. It's coming up in just a few weeks, specifically focused on these very fascinating um, vernal pools. So we have a vernal palooza event coming up in the Hocking Hills um, at Camp Odioqua, March 7th through the 9th. The registration is still open for a few days if anyone should be interested. Another interesting uh, category of, of wetlands that can incorporate forested wetlands, vernal pools, emergent marsh um, would be beaver impoundments. Beavers are notorious for changing up the landscape, changing hydrology, and therefore expanding the footprint um, and the water depths within wetlands. So we threw that in as an extra category. And then finally, we have some less common um, wetland types that we have here in Ohio. These are bogs, which tend to form in isolated depressions. They're notorious for being dominated by sphagnum mosses and very unique plants that grow in nutrient poor, um, low pH conditions. And then we have fens, which have a um, similar aspect to, to bogs. Oftentimes they'll have a lot of sphagnum and other mosses um, and a unique uh, vegetation assemblage, but they have more nutrient rich water coming through the um, fen by virtue of uh, groundwater seeps that release at the surface and, and flow through the, the fen environment. And these tend to be alkaline rather than acid, as we see in the bogs. So I, I want to uh, give you a moment to read this quote by a famous botanist, Carl Linnaeus. Um, he's, he's one of our um, kind of standout taxonomists. The guy uh, loved plants and um, wetlands have a lot of fascinating plants if you've ventured into one. Uh, but here he is uh, trash talking wetlands and muskegs, which are a peatland type of wetland, um, uh, comparing them to the river Styx, the river that you cross to get to hell. Needless to say, wetlands have had some public relations um, image issues. And if you put yourself in the boots of uh, our predecessors of pioneers trying to cross uh, landscapes in, in North America, particularly the former Great Black Swamp up in uh, Northwest Ohio, uh, you can imagine if you're um, trying to drag a, a wagon through a uh, deep flooded area that goes on for miles and miles that you might not favor wetlands. So in part due to uh, the public perception, negative public perception of wetlands and the demand for uh, arable land to grow crops and to um, build homes, we've seen some dramatic losses in our wetland resources um, around the world, around the US, and particularly in Ohio, where we've lost more than 90% of our, our wetlands. We're number two in the nation in terms of wetland loss right behind California. 
and draining uh, the land to improve it, quote unquote, uh, was the standard practice for for decades. Um, it was only much later in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when we started to recognize the importance of wetlands and the the damage that was being uh, uh, brought about by uh, this just stepwise loss of, of wetland resources. The uh, duck hunting community was among the first to raise a red flag of concern as they noticed uh, dwindling hunting opportunities. And then we started looking more closely at the, not just the habitat that wetlands provide, but many other ecosystem services. And this led to a national uh, goal of no net loss um, that was implemented under um, George Bush Sr. Um, which basically set the stage for our mitigation programs so that when we do have to fill a wetland for another purpose, it is replaced um, somewhere on the landscape um, to offset those impacts. So we do have some protections in place, but in general, um, wetland regulation has kind of been a political football um, ever since we started protecting wetlands. There was a recent decision, um, the Sackett decision, as it's referred, that removed a lot of the protections from um, wetlands at the federal level. And the graphic that um, you see on the right here, um, I thought was very informative. It shows the, the different eras of wetland regulation, what was protected, what was discretionary, and what was unprotected. And um, with the um, Sackett decision, we've opened up a lot of area that, uh, a lot of wetland area that's no longer protected. Uh, a funny story with this particular graphic is I saw it shared on LinkedIn and thought it was really a great um, graphic, uh, very informative. So I shared it with staff um, only to find out that Robert, uh, pictured in the lower left, who is our restoration designer, actually had created it. And I had no idea. Um, he relocated to South Carolina um, to work at, uh, well, he's working for us, but working at Clemson, um, where his wife is working on her doctorate. And he, uh, he had developed this graphic for his wife's advisor um, who hires him to do some, some design work. So when I shared it out, he informed me that that was his his drawing. Um, thankfully, I think the Ohio EPA is kind of stepping into the void in terms of protections and the, uh, the, the boxes that are shown in blue represent those areas where um, our evolving regulations um, are likely to be um, modified so that Ohio protects um, those those features. So, why protect wetlands? Why are these rules and regulations important? Well, it's because wetlands are extremely valuable to humanity. Uh, they're important for our quality of life. There was a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that really called attention to this, um, looking at the different aspects of, of wetlands, the benefits that they provide, often operating in the, in the background. But there are many cultures that uh, derive um, direct benefits from food and fiber coming from wetlands. Um, wetlands support a lot of different um, biota, including humans, but certainly wildlife. They provide regulating services, um, controlling flooding and improving our water quality, recharging our groundwater. And they provide a lot of opportunities for humans to connect with the environment in terms of recreation, um, stewardship, just general enjoyment. Um, so cultural uh, services are something that I think are, are um, 
very important to me and, and many others. So this graphic very nicely kind of lays out the regulating services that wetlands offer. Um, most of our water um, should flow through wetlands before reaching streams if it weren't for the extensive wetland loss. Um, wetlands do a lot of the work of um, our more synthetic substitutes, um, such as storm detention basins, and they also provide uh, habitat um, and arguably better water quality improvement. And they also provide opportunities for groundwater recharge, more sustained uh, stream flows so that those, those base flows are more uh, predictable over the uh, course of a year. Streams are less flashy. There's a lot of ecological recovery that can occur when we start paying attention to these regulating services and start to um, put wetlands back on the landscape. This list um, just runs down some of the problems that are caused or exacerbated by wetland loss. And so the preceding slide kind of highlights how wetlands work. And you can imagine if the wetlands aren't there, uh, that that many of these uh, uh, sources of degradation will kind of play out, reduce biological diversity as a result of loss of habitat, um, increased erosion and bank failure in streams because we're forcing all of our water into drains that fast tracks that water into streams that that uh, aren't properly sized for the level of flows being forced through. We get increased flooding, decreased water quality. Um, fewer opportunities to sequester carbon um, in the growing um, vegetation of wetlands, and uh, we diminish our cultural services. So I like to say that wetlands work wonders. There's just a lot of really great things that happen in and around wetlands. So you might ask, how can we get more of them back on the landscape? Now, thankfully, we're in an era right now where there seems to be a very heavy focus on restoration. And we are seeing some of these areas that have been historically drained and modified returned uh, to the landscape as functioning wetlands. And this is one area that we've been doing a lot of work in, um, looking at site selection, site review, the the site assessment work, design, construction oversight, and planting to bring these um, wetlands back into existence. And it's very rewarding work uh, to see a, a wetland uh, come back to life. So the, I wanted to kind of share the basics of, of restoration. It's pretty straightforward. You know, there's a a lot of learning that has to happen in terms of understanding soils and hydrology and, and plant communities. But the work on the ground uh, involves one of three things and oftentimes a combination thereof. That is a tile disruption, taking tiles um, out of the equation or intercepting tile drainage so that uh, water will uh, remain at the soil surface for longer periods of time and wetlands can therefore form. Excavation to create more storage volume, more depth, um, and more water improvement opportunities within the wetland, as well as valuable habitat. And then embankment building up areas uh, at the low end of a, a slope to um, create a little more storage capacity. And um, the excavation and embankment are typically used hand in hand because when you create um, depressional features where you're excavating material, you have a surplus of material that has to go somewhere. And usually the budgets that we're working with for uh, conservation endeavors are not adequate to haul a lot of soil into a site or off site 
So we tend to work it out to balance our cut and fill volumes so that um, we're just moving soil around to create the hydrology, the hydro period that we're looking for. We're not moving things uh, off site. And uh, every project is a little bit different in terms of the tile influence and how much excavation and embankment. Uh, but between those three uh, tools in the restoration toolkit, um, we can get some pretty nice wetlands established and back on the landscape. This is a case in point. Um, this was a project that we did for the Nature Conservancy that um, is referred to as the Sandhill Crane Wetlands. Um, 280 acres of farm field, very wet farm field in the Oak Openings region with um, sandy soils and a high water table. And um, we had the distinct privilege of working with the Nature Conservancy on this restoration. Um, and uh, we were thrilled this past summer when we went up to retrieve some SD cards from a trail camera uh, to see that the Sandhill Cranes had definitely taken to the site, which is great considering the fact that it was named the Sandhill Wetlands, Sandhill Crane Wetlands before uh, Sandhills had a habitat there. Um, and we're happy that those have showed up in force. So I want to talk about a couple of other um, wetlands that we've put on the map. Um, this is a smattering of, of the projects um, that we've been working on. So we're doing work all over the state. But I want to pay special attention to a big wetland with big impacts and a little wetland with big impacts. <clears throat> so this first project was a what's referred to as a treatment train wetland um, to improve water quality coming into Grand Lake St. Mary's. And this was funded through uh, H2 Ohio, the grant program, which has just been a transformative program for um, increasing our wetland resources in the state. Um, so it was really nice to be able to work on this project and um, have the funding available through H2 Ohio. So this is the Burntwood Langenkamp Wetland Conservation Area. It's approximately 85 acres of farmland that was converted to upland forest and emergent marsh. Um, we have a meandering flow path that diverts water from Burntwood Creek, which is um, here, if you can see my cursor on the east side of the site. Um, the water flows through a notch um, into a, a forebay, which is the deepest feature in this uh, wetland treatment train to drop out uh, heavy materials, sediment, and um, some of the nutrients and phosphorus certainly are associated with that. So there's a settling basin, and then the water enters um, a series of um, wetland cells that meander through the property. The flow length from um, the entry point back out to the exit on Coldwater Creek is over a mile in length. So there's a lot of wetland for water to pass through. And these wetland cells have the capacity to store over 20 million gallons, 61.5 um, acre feet um, in the uh, meandering marsh and the entire site, which includes some additional peripheral wetlands to capture runoff from adjacent farm fields can hold even more. And the engineering team that worked on this project with us, Access Engineering, um, also added a um, pump to uh, move additional water through the system when Burntwood Creek wasn't um, in flood and flooding through the, the notch. So we just have a, a few photos of um, the site as it's developing. Vegetation is still establishing on this site, so we foresee um, only uh, greater improvements in water quality over time, but um, the site is already performing quite well. And one of the things that they've been doing with H2 Ohio, which I think is admirable um, and really important, is that they have hardwired uh, site monitoring 
um, into the program so that when we're done with our work of design and, and uh, restoration, um, academic teams come in and begin to collect water quality data to evaluate how these different can differently configured wetlands that are funded under H2 Ohio are performing. And the thought is that over time we can kind of um, refine our thinking, uh, determine strategies that are particularly effective or maybe ineffective, um, and uh, learn about the restoration process um, through the through the sampling that's being done by the Lake Erie Aquatic Research Network. This particular site was monitored by Dr. Stephen Jackman with Wright State, and he and his team did a lot of uh, sampling inflow and outflow, um, particularly within that meandering marsh area. And he reported out to um, the H2 Ohio folks and other partners on uh, what their research was showing. And it was pretty exciting um, for the from inflow to outflow. He was finding uh, an 80 percent reduction in total nitrogen and a 70 percent reduction in total phosphorus, which is great. Um, the the only uh, downside to the study was that we can only get about 5% of the total discharge coming through Burntwood Creek um, into and through the wetland, uh, which really just tells us we need a few more wetlands um, up and down the um, watershed to, uh, to capture that water. But for the amount of land area, um, this wetland is doing some pretty heavy lifting for improving water quality. Uh, moving water out to Grand Lake St. Mary's. And the hope is that um, over time, as these projects are being implemented around the lake, that uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's will have um, less, less frequent, less severe um, issues with harmful algal blooms. One other notable observation is that we set up some uh, trail cameras on this site, and we were pleased to see the variety of um, waterfowl and different things using the site. This was a flock of green wing teal. And you can see from the um, inset map that um, green wing teal in terms of um, nesting tend to occur up around Lake Erie, but they're, they found this site and seem to be using it. And um, I don't know if it's possible that maybe we'll see them reproducing of the site at some point in the future, but it's uh, great that they found this a, a good usable habitat. The next project I want to talk about is one of um, one of my earliest. Uh, this this is a project here in Westerville, my hometown. Uh, the site is uh, just literally a few blocks from my house, so I kind of obsess over this one and spend a lot of time there. And I want to share some some stories that have originated um, at Highlands Park. This. Um, Work was completed in uh, 2012, um, so we're a little bit over the 10-year mark. Uh, the footprint of this wetland area, you can see in the image on the left, the before photo, uh, there's just sort of a shaggy appearance um, to that form. And it was um, nothing but invasive um, cattail the hybrid um, narrowleaf, broadleaf cattail that just dominated the site. Interestingly, if we turn back the clock um, 40 years from when that photo was taken, the entire property that is now Highlands Park was farmland. There was not a stitch of natural vegetation on the site. But you could see this dark signature area in the soils, which I like to refer to as a ghost of a wetland. Um, the hydric soils ran right down through that area, and they were artificially drained with um, clay pipe. When the city uh, acquired the land um, and really weren't, uh, they weren't paying much attention to maintenance of the drainage tile system, things started to break down and clog, and gradually water um, started to build back into this former wetland footprint. But unfortunately, because this was a kind of an unintentional restoration, um, what nature had to work with was uh, cattail. 
Um, there wasn't much else there in terms of the plant community um, to uh, reestablish. And so we had a monoculture, near a near monoculture of cattail. So when the city was renovating um, their community pool and the park in general um, around 2010, they started looking at this wetland site and said, hey, could we do something here? Could we make this a central feature, uh, an entry point? And we had the good fortune to um, win this project and get the opportunity to design um, not only an enhancement of the existing wetland, but an expansion. So we um, added um, some wide meanders um, to, the, to the wetland to move the water back and forth over a longer flow path that helped the site be eligible for a clean water grant. Um, this entire drainage um, exits the site through a culvert and um, it goes to a, a stream that is in non-attainments of, of its aquatic life uses. So EPA was particularly interested in um, intercepting uh, some of the contaminants and nutrients in this wetland to help improve the health of Spring Run and, and uh, Alum Creek um, to which it's a tributary. And we were um, also given the opportunity to reconfigure a um, standard storm detention basin uh, as part of the overall uh, wetland um, environment. So in total, we added a full acre of wetland in this project. Everything here is um, stormwater driven. So there's a stormwater pipe at the north end of the site, um, probably a buried stream. Uh, at one point, there may have been more of a surface stream coming through, but as we tend to do in urban areas, um, it was run into a pipe. And so the pipe enters from the north end of the site and meanders through and then run off from the site um, which is now intercepted um, in some bioswales and then um, slowly drained into the former um, storm detention basin will eventually uh, work its way into the, the main wetland. So we've got a couple of different techniques of uh, managing um, nutrients and contamination. So here's some before and after views um, facing north across the site. In the before image, um, you can just see gigantic uh, cattail, hybrid cattail. Um, and it now looks much more like the photo on the right with a mixture of native plants growing across the site. Um, this next image is facing south through the park. The trees you see there are bald cypress, which are a little bit north of their native range, um, but they were planted by one of the former park managers who just wanted to add a little bit of diversity. And they had done so well at this site, we knew we had to design around them and try to preserve that, that bit of um, interesting uh, vegetation and habitat. So we did just that. The wetland includes a nature play area. We try to encourage um, families to get out and explore this wetland environment. Um, our, our before picture here is really a deering picture with uh, a lot of volunteers helping to uh, plant the site after the heavy construction had been done. And you can see how nicely that environment had, had rebounded. <clears throat> and we saw some major gains in terms of the uh, biological diversity at the site. And some of this was very deliberate because we were planting a lot of different species of plants. Um, and uh, other aspects of this were kind of happenstance. And that was the wildlife response to this restored habitat um, with, with more available um, zones, niches within the system. So the bottom graph shows our um, the number of animal species we had documented when it was a cattail marsh um, and the number of plant species in blue. The enhanced marsh, uh, you can see the dramatic increase in the total number of animal species documented and the number of plant species that are present. And um, in 2017, this was where our, our 
tallies were in terms of um, numbers of um, species of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, et cetera. One of our most exciting finds was just this past summer. Um, we uh, had an intern that was working with us who um, was over at the site helping to set some funnel traps for some sampling that we were doing. And she was big into birding and knew her bird calls. And we got an excited uh, text from Megan, who was just uh, giddy with excitement because she was hearing a least bittern, which is a state and threatened um, state threatened species. So I was able to race over um, and join her and uh, learn the call of the least bittern. We couldn't spot the sucker. Um, but uh, it was, you know, deep in the reeds. They're very secretive animals. Um, but I, I did a little bit of reading up on the species and found that they were most active in the early morning hours. And so I headed over the next morning. And sure enough, it was out and about. And I captured the images you see there with my iPhone, which were respectable. Um, but I was uh, really pleased uh, to notify Jim McCormick. Um, who showed up at the site a couple days later and took a much better photo of our least bittern. Um, so he was able to confirm the sighting and get a really beautiful shot. So if uh, Jim happens to be listening, thank you, Jim, for sharing that image. Because this project was um, focused on um, water quality because of the funding source of uh, Section 319, the Clean Water Grant, we did some sampling within the system and we were able to show that um, this wetland, even in an urban setting, was doing a good job of um, removing phosphorus and nitrogen. It was a little bit of a complicated effort because we had multiple points of entry. It wasn't just a single inflow and a single outflow, but when we looked at the, the major inflow, which is the north inflow and um, additional points within the wetland, including the um, outflow where it would discharge the stream. We were seeing good statistically significant results reducing um, phosphorus and nitrogen. So I have just a um, series of, of photos of the site and some of the activities, the ways that uh, um, this park has uh, touched um, the local community. Um, the mound you see here is actually some of the spoils that were placed um, from the wetland excavation because we did remove some material to give us some deeper zones um, and add those meanders. Um, that's now a fun hill for kids to play on and a sledding hill. We uh, tackled a whole hillside of invasive calorie pear um, and are trying to restore the natural buffers around the site. We planted um, a prairie buffer around the uh, wetland. And here you can see some children looking for insects and frogs um, among the cut plants and other things that grow around the uh, perimeter of the wetland area. It's a great place to uh, visit at sunset. I feel like some of the best sunsets I've ever seen have been at this park. Beautiful view across the wetland. And every day brings something new, um, something interesting and different to see. This is one of our great tree frogs sitting on top of a swamp rose. That's the kind of stuff that keeps us motivated. <clears throat> so one of the things we did with this park, we pitched an idea to the city of Westerville after realizing that post-restoration, we started seeing an uptick in um, frog and toad use. And we realized in the first year that we had um, documented seven species of frogs and toads that were utilizing the site. And we were pretty excited about that. I think the um, stream connection helped these uh, critters find their way into this environment. And we proposed uh, doing public education um, around a program called Frog Friday which is really a thinly veiled disguise to get people out to learn about wetlands, but we have a blast looking at frogs and toads. Um, if you hit the site at the right time in the spring, and we have 
six uh, Frog Fridays that we do um, spaced throughout the spring and early summer, specifically to try to catch peak activity of certain things. And if you're out um, on the right night in March, you might see 300 adult toads, American toads, and a few fowler's toads um, swimming about on the water, trilling and, and laying eggs. And then in um, June, usually late June, early July, um, the, the wetlands are just loaded and the grass, uh, the turf areas around the wetlands are loaded with baby um, toads, which makes for some fun programming, fun exploration with kids, great way to connect them to the natural world. We go out and look for the gray tree frogs that are hanging out on the bald cypress trees or sitting on the leaves of the cup plants. And the program has been very popular. Um, we've had evenings where we've had more than 200 people show up um, for these events, which is great. The kids love it. The toads tolerate it. Um, we had to shut the um, program down uh, when the pandemic hit, but we actually had a, a season of virtual Frog Fridays, which um, are uh, no substitute for actual Frog Fridays, but we made the best of it. Here's some more um, kids enjoying the green frogs and metamorphosing um, tadpoles. So having these, having these sorts of sites um, are really a, a great way to engage citizens. You can get them involved in um, the restoration process itself um, and then continue to educate around um, this, this wetland environment. They really are important areas for um, community engagement. So I wanna end with a few stories related to cultural services. Um, I think this is something that we need to be talking more about. Um, and I, I have some really great stories from the, the site that I was just talking about that um, are near and dear to my heart. Um, I have more opportunity at Highlands Park because I live so close to encounter um, interesting people, um, interesting things, uh, interesting situations. And I've kind of um, compiled some of these, these stories to talk about. So the first um, story regarding cultural services has to do with a photographer, a wildlife photographer named Bill Baird. I ran across Bill um, one day, just, um, uh, you know, just a surprise encounter. I'd never met him, uh, but he was out of the site uh, taking some pictures and I struck up a conversation. And uh, Bill explained to me that his favorite thing to photograph was wading birds. And he lived in the community, um, but he would um, hop in his car on um, when he was ready for a, a photo expedition. And he had um, three different sites he would go to in three different counties. One where he would reliably see this bird, the great egret. Another where he would see um, a lot of uh, great blue heron. And another where he would see green heron. And he was coming home from this like 60 mile route that he would drive. And he um, decided to stop in at Highlands. He didn't know anything about it. He thought, you know, he knew that something had happened um, with the wetlands there, but he wanted to check it out for himself. Um, and he said he got uh, parked in the parking lot adjacent to the wetland. He leaned into his car to grab his camera. And when he stood up and looked out at the wetland, he realized from where he stood, he could see a great egret, a great blue heron, and a green heron. And he continued to go back to the site um, routinely after that. Um, he actually showed up at our office unannounced one day and gave us this picture in a frame, uh, which is one of his great blue heron pictures from the park, just as a gesture of thanks for the work that we did in restoring that wetland. And he later um, sent me this photo, which he said he was very embarrassed of because it wasn't in focus, but he was at the park when a bald eagle flew over and he noticed it at the last minute and couldn't quite get a, a good bead on the, 
bird, but I said, I'll take it for photo documentation because that's pretty exciting to know that eagles have even uh, flown over the site. This final story was a unique one. Um, I stopped in at the park on a Saturday and noticed a group of people standing down at the uh, one end of the parking lot. And I wandered down and started looking at what was going on and uh, met the uh, Columbus Plain Air Society. And they were all out uh, painting the, the wetlands. Just magical, uh, really cool to see um, the impact that this wetland was having on people. And um, so I kind of admired their work and I opened my big mouth and, and asked, are any of these paintings for sale? Thinking this was too, too good to not have some kind of memento. And 14 people handed me their business cards and uh, I ended up having to make kind of an awkward decision on the spot of a, a painting that I would like to have for the office. I selected the one in the center here, the watercolor, um, asked the artist how much he wanted for it. He said a hundred bucks. Um, he ripped it off the easel and just gave me a business card and trusted me to mail him a hundred bucks. And I thought that was very fair and um, surprising. Um, I then took the uh, painting across the street from our offices where there's a framing shop and I had to spend twice that much to put the silly thing in a frame. Um, but it hangs at our office as a proud reminder of the impact that this work can have on um, individuals and, and communities. So with that, I'm going to close and say that wetlands are worth it. And if you'd like to put some wetland on it, please contact me. Thanks so much, Mark. I love, I love the, um, the artwork story. It sure does cost a lot to frame things these days, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so we do have some questions and we have some time. So let's see what we can answer here. Um, when you were talking about the wetlands, um, someone's inquiring about maybe if you could share a couple of the names of the perimeter plants that you used in the plantings. Sure. Um, if you recall. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about highlands um, specifically, um, we've got um, downy sunflower. We've got um, trying to think about some of the species that are out there. Um, it's a little closer to the wetland edge, but obedient plant is a beautiful one, and it it grows in kind of saturated um, conditions near the edges. Um, we have some of the typical um, prairie species like. Um, Blazing Star, um, Brown-Eyed Susan. Um, the, the list, I mean, we have over 200 species of plants documented oh, wow. at this site. Um, okay. And, and there's a lot of different opportunities um, to establish, um, you know, good, yeah. healthy vegetation in this sort of an environment. Um, wild Senna is one that um, comes to mind. Um, I think we've got some sawtooth sunflower, uh, prairie dock, okay. um, some of those really robust um, prairie species. Cup plant is one of my favorites because, um, primarily because the gray tree frogs love it. Um, the, the leaves join at the stem and hold water, and the gray tree frogs sit in those puddles like it's their little, you know, uh, <laughs> penthouse in the sky. Right. <laughs> so, of course, there's going to be a question about invasives. So after your wetland restoration, <clears throat> do you have any problems with invasive plants coming in? And if so, how do you deal with them in the short and long term? Yeah, well, when I'm dispensing advice on, on invasives in the restoration process, I always advocate for diligence, um, extreme diligence in the first few years. Um, it's, it's easy to maybe say, oh, we've just got a little bit of invasive uh, plant material coming in here and a, little, you know, a few invasives coming in over here. I'm not gonna bother with it. Um, it'll get away from you quick. 
But if if you get a good, healthy um, planting and seeding established, and then for the first three you know years or so, you're really minding the shop. You're going out and looking for starts of invasive species and trying to you know pull them, spray them, treat them in whatever way um, to remove them. Um, you can get a plant community that is much more resilient against invasion in the future. I, I view the establishment process as a below ground battle. It's all about root mass and which species can get claim the most territory um, below ground. And um, our invasives are notorious for being very efficient at that. They put down a lot of root structure, rhizomes just run every which way. Um, and if they get in there early, uh, before the natives, which are slower growing, have a chance to put down roots, you've got problems. But if you can keep them out uh, to buy some time for the natives, um, the natives will fill in and the whole system becomes much more um, resilient to invasion. So we still have some cattail at this site. We have a little pocket of reed canary grass and we monitor it, but it seems that they're not really going anywhere because they're hemmed in by other natives that have dense root systems. And it just seems like we can have a few of these things in the mix um, without being problematic. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Okay, and one, one last question here. It has to do with when you're establishing a wetland and the holding areas capture a lot of chemical runoff, what are the consequences of such a concentration? It would depend on what we're talking about. Sure. Um, wetlands in general are, um, you know, pretty resilient. Um, the contaminants tend to get Kind of buried in the in the sediments. If it's something that's extremely toxic, it you know might cause some issues. Um, but you know certainly most of our urban runoff um, tends to the the contaminants in urban runoff will tend to um, degrade um, or or get kind of absorbed to the clays in the soils where they're not going to do as much harm. Um, and that's one thing that wetlands are good at is, is capturing those chemicals, kind of burying them, sequestering them. Um, but, you know, if you had a, a major spill, um, there could be some, you know, long-term impairment uh, before the system could recover. We, at this location, we actually had an a incident where there was a release of um, hydraulic fluid from a um, trash truck that... Um, ruptured a line or something near a storm drain and it ended up in the wetland. Um, and I heard from a friend of mine who's a neighbor to the site that they could smell this kind of fuel smell. Um, and uh, the city had to launch a emergency response to get some oil absorbent booms out and um, try to try to uh, gather up the, the uh, contamination, um, which was pretty effective, but you just mm -hmm. never know, you know, what uh, yeah. what may happen. Um, but I, I would say the system has recovered from that. Um, and I lied. I'm going to ask one more question just because I, I was curious too, and it popped up. What was the date of your Highland restoration project? So the, like what, yeah, because everyone's like impressed with the wildlife response. So how yeah. much time passed before that happened? So um, 2011 was when most of the earthwork was done. And then um, by the end of 2012, we had all the plantings and all that done. So it's, okay. you know, it's, it's more than 10 years old at this point, but it took um, a surprisingly short period of time for the plant community to really establish. I mean, within um, the first year, it was hard to tell that we'd been in there with heavy equipment. You know, it's um, nature recovers pretty quickly. By the second mm -hmm. year, things were so lush and green and covered over um, that uh, you, you would never know that um, anybody was in there with uh, yellow iron moving dirt around. Wow. Um, wow. The, the one area of bare soil where the volunteers were planting near those stepping stones in the nature play area, I was uh, very nervous about that location in particular because the soil was so hard that volunteers couldn't get a um, a dibble bar into it. They couldn't literally couldn't cut a hole in the ground um, to plant a plant. 
And um, we, we ended up bringing in um, some power augers to drill holes uh, and put plants in. And I, I had extreme concerns that, you know, it wasn't going to uh, recover over time. But amazingly, that whole area is just full of vegetation now. The plants can, you know, work through it. And uh, it's, nice. um, you, you know, you wouldn't know it was such a tough clay from the way things are looking now. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks so much, Mark. You're welcome. Thanks for have having a good me. Day. You bet. So we have our next guest here, Chris Faleber. You are here. Great. Hey. Well, I'm here. Hi, Thank you for having me today. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> well, Chris is a horticulturist at Chanticleer Garden, and today he is presenting plant communities, um, gardens as social infrastructure. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. Let's uh, try to get the screen share going here. You bet. Ah, you've got your here. work t-shirt on there. I see the shanty. Yeah, I'm st yes. I'm still working today. So um, <laughs> I actually just came in from outside. We were um, making a uh, a new bed um, underneath our kind of iconic Katsura trees, and oh. so it was. Uh, now is the perfect time of the year to do that. So we're expanding it to protect the root system uh, nice. underneath the drip line. And so awesome. I was spreading compost and uh, getting it and leaf mulch and getting it ready for spring planting. Excellent. So uh, let's see. Can you see my screen? Looks great. Now? Yeah, it looks fabulous. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to stop the video here. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get started. So thank you so much, Renee, and thank you everyone for having me here today. I'm thrilled to talk to you about this. Uh, we will, I do, as Renee mentioned, I do work at Chanticleer Garden. That is my uh, day job. Uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, something I've been working on on the side for the past decade. This is kind of my passion project uh, and what I'm calling plant community gardens as social infrastructure. Um, but I like to go ahead and begin um, all of my presentations um, with this slide right here. Uh, and this is showing Roy Diblick. I know he's spoken uh, to this group in the past. I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with him. And I show this slide because he's a key mentor for me. Uh, I've been very privileged and fortunate to have a number of mentors in the field of public horticulture, Jeff Epping, Ed Lyon, Richard Hockey, all of my colleagues here at Chanticleer Garden. Uh, and I show this slide because it's so important and essential, especially in our field of hort horticulture, for there to be mentors. Uh, as many of you know, uh, formal education programs are starting to disappear. Uh, and there's many alternative modes of entry into this field and people come at it from uh, non-traditional backgrounds. Uh, they may not even go to school. They might just uh, start working um, in high school and continue with it from there. And it's so essential that we have people to guide the next generation, to help them along because Let's face it, it's not easy to make a living as a gardener. Uh, and so those of you who are already you know, somewhat in advanced in your career, uh, established, I hope you'll take the time to find a young person. You know, Usually I give this talk you know, at an in-person event and I'm always trying to uh, make sure I'm introducing people and getting them uh, connected with each other. And I always encourage young people and old people alike to introduce themselves to each other because you never know where you might find that next resource, that next mentor to help you out. So I really encourage everyone uh, to take part in mentorship. Uh, and I've been influenced a lot by this man, by Roy, uh, and you'll definitely hear me uh, reference him a lot today. Or as when I worked at Northwind Perennial Farm, his place, what we affectionately referred to as Roy-isms. And so... Um, these are, this is going to be a series of images uh, taken from a plane. Normally, as I said, when these are in person, I can say I flew the plane here. Uh, not so much for the virtual today, uh, but I like starting with these images because it, it's a look at the landscape, kind of that bird's eye view. And we can see how we as humans have begun to influence it, how we live with the landscape uh, and how our human centered priorities have come to dominate it from the ways we live, to the way we feed ourselves. And even in the most remote corners, we cannot stop our compulsion to subjugate the landscape to our will by building roads. This is in the middle of the Nevada desert. There seems to be nothing really going on in that picture, but you can see all the roads over there. And there's a term for this. It's called the road effect zone. Uh, and what that finds is even though pavement covers less than 1% of all the land in the United States, 
its effects uh, influence 20% of the land mass, and that's roads alone. So simply from roads alone, we have influenced and affected one-fifth of all the land in the United States. And that's in part because we've designed our landscapes, at least for the past century or so, especially in the United States, for one thing. And that's cars. And this is an image I took a few weeks ago when I spoke at the Chicago Botanic Garden. It's looking outside my hotel room. And you can see everything in that landscape is built around roads and cars, from the big parking lot to the road in the back. If I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, to the side roads. And even there's this little strip of green going through there, kind of on that curve, that bend. Whoops. And that's actually a stream. It's a stream that's been channelized in concrete. And, you know, we've subjected it. We've looked at that and said, this is a problem. We need to drain this water as fast as possible. And this at likely at one point was a lush wetland, as we just heard about the importance of them in our landscapes. And we've eliminated those possibilities because we have a need to drive everywhere. Uh, you know, and this is not a pleasant landscape. And even in my hotel room at any hour of the day, I could always hear the constant hum of traffic. And there's consequences to this. Our relationship to the natural world has suffered. We're disconnected and ungrounded. And this has consequences, consequences not only to individuals, but to societies as well, from our health and our ability uh, to find resilience as humanity and in resilience in the environment, especially in the face of climate change. So how did we get here? Uh, I love this image right here, and I think it sums it up quite well. Uh, kind of in our Western approach to land, uh, we have quite an adversarial relationship with nature. It's something to be conquered and overcome. Uh, you know, kind of the pioneer spirit or the frontier ethic in our agrarian history, as Roy would say. You know, we're kind of dominating the land solely for our own benefit. And I don't know who would, um, I, I certainly wouldn't hire a landscape service called Man Versus Tree, but uh, I see these signs all over the place in my hometown of Elm Grove, Wisconsin, and the surrounding area. And obviously this person does quite well for themselves because you see their signs everywhere. And, you know, that's an approach that um, most people don't even think about. It's common. You know, but it's so contrary because we are nature, we're a part of it, and we need it now more than ever. So what are the mindsets and practices besides our Western history that have led to and support this approach? Well, let's think about the way we talk about uh, our relationship to landscape and gardens. You know, we use this term maintenance, and so I looked up the definition of it. Very simple. And you know, what does that maintain? And you can see that little highlight right there. And, and it means to keep in a specified state or position. And so what that means is we're essentially forcing our gardens into arrested development. You know, public culture is not fixed, neither are gardens. You know, and I find that to be deeply uncomfortable because. We as people, we as community are constantly changing and evolving all the time. But if we don't allow our landscapes, our gardens to as well, well, what does that mean? You know, we're changing, but we're not allowing everything else around us to. Um, I find that to be quite unsettling. And, you know, I think we need to spend a lot more time and, you know, or we, I should say we do spend a lot more time and energy preventing things from growing than we actually do cultivate, cultivating uh, and promoting growth. You know, but maintenance is it's a good business practice. It's expensive and it makes money, but it has really minimal benefits for us and the planet. And therefore, I like the term stewardship much better. We'll talk about a lot of that throughout the presentation today. And, you know, kind of with that approach, let's continue with some of the vocabulary we use. We don't use the term gardening anymore. Gardening's become yard work. You know, gardening is a practice, something to be uh, enjoyed, uh, maybe to be a part of our daily lives, you know, kind of like how people uh, use the term to describe a yoga practice or something like that. But now that we've translated that to yard work, it's not something to be enjoyed. It's something to be accomplished. It's something for either the weekend warrior or to be outsourced to the lowest to the lowest bidder bitter and you know once we gardened our world uh if we look back at indigenous cultures you know they've gardened north america for thousands of years uh and now it's relegated to a hobby uh for those with the time and money to pursue it often later in life and uh, i kind of look at it through uh the lens of capitalism and consumerism and what i call the two w's which has reduced it to work and waste and um, that's what we see here in this in this slide, you know, yard waste. That's the term we have now. It's because we've taken a commercial and an industrial approach to nature. You know, there is no waste in nature. There's just, um, you know, 
the uh, only opportunities for more life. Everything's recycled. This creates habitat niches, you know, fallen leaves, dead wood. All of these things are utilized by all sorts of wonderful things. And we're hauling that away and we're using huge machines in order to do this. I'm always amazed every autumn uh, around where I live here, just outside of uh, Philadelphia. This past autumn, I saw um, a, a crew of people. They had two dump trucks, a giant machine to suck up and grind up the leaves, and about eight people blocking traffic to do that. And the amount of carbon emissions that went into it to haul this wonderful resource away, grind it up, compost it, then use these giant diesel machines to bring it back again, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and I'll go to use Royism here, uh, as he always used to say, no one rakes the woods. Uh, and I quite love that, but yet we seem to have lost sight of it. And uh, instead, of looking at all of these wonderful organic matter as a resource, it's now termed waste. And what is the result of these mindsets? Well, this, these are the landscapes that we see all over the place in our daily lives. You know, this is a landscape, but it's certainly not a garden. It's designed for cars and profit, but not, not life, not biodiversity, and not people. And it's wasteful. It's energy and input intensive, and it's environmentally harmful. And they replace this thing at least three times a year. You have actually four times a year, I should say. You have a spring display, a summer display, an autumn display when the mums come back in, and then they cover it with pine bows in the wintertime. And every time they're doing that, they're replacing the mulch and they're irrigating this. And that sidewalk there, which I think I'm the only person I've ever seen walk along it. I only went out there to take this picture. Uh, and you see the irrigation on that and the water running off straight into the storm drain. And you see people People come out and spray chemicals and fertilizer all of over all of this, you know, and it's not enriching at all. Uh, but it does make this company a lot of money, and they've been doing it consistently for the past eight years. I could have taken a picture of this any time in the past eight years, and it really wouldn't look much different at all. And we have maintenance that's excessive and unnecessary. Sometimes it's uh, exploitative as well. I always look at landscape crews and try to see, have they been provided with the proper safety gear? And that's what I look at as the initial mark of quality, because if a company's not caring for their employees, how can you expect them to care for your garden as well? And it's really unfortunate how often you see people using these big machines or a string, uh, a string trimmer in the landscape, and they don't have hearing protection on, they don't have eye protection on, you know, and how silly is this, using this giant mower to take care of less than a foot of grass along a sidewalk? And we have maintenance that's misguided. Um, this is pan uh, panicum that was cut back in the middle of the season. You know, you look at that, that's flowering at two and a half, three feet tall. And the only reason was because someone came through here with the hedge trimmers. You know, they didn't know what they were doing. It went to the lowest bidder, as I mentioned before, and they just went through and hedged everything. Didn't matter what it was. And often still to this day, so much of our maintenance is actually harmful to plants. This is a shopping center not far from Chanticleer Garden. And they do this every single year, often twice a year, the dreaded volcano mulching. And I can't believe that they do it. And every year I go back and I see how many more trees have come to this and died. And it's so wasteful. You see that you can go to any community in North America and see people just with their gas powered blower, taking all this wonderful organic matter and just spreading it out into the road, kind of the tragedy of the commons, if you will. I don't understand why people do this, um, but they've spread it out into the road. Um, not so much here, but in other places, you see a lot of this goes straight to the storm sewer and it's just washed away and people kind of write it off. Well, that's not my problem anymore. Um, and it's an unfortunate thing. But why do we have so much of this happening all the time? Well, unfortunately, uh, we've been sold a lot of unrealistic landscapes. We see them all the time. You know, uh, these are artificial things that can only be maintained by a lot of money and resources. And Harvard University was one of them. Uh, this is the main green right there. Uh, and it looks lush and wonderful in this picture. Um, but as all of you know, I'm sure, grass was never meant to grow under a dense shaded canopy. Uh, and that's true. The grass doesn't grow there. This is reseeded and resodded twice a year, once in the spring, just in time for graduation, and again in the late summer, just in time for students and their parents to return to campus. Uh, but yet so many people see stuff like this all over the place, and they try to replicate it in their home gardens. My dad was guilty of this for a number of years. Every year, he said, I've seen people do this, and so I'm going to try to keep growing grass underneath his maple trees back home, and it never worked. Uh, but it costs a lot of money, and so those who do follow this business model, they're quite happy with it. 
And what's the result of that? Well, what I call everywhere USA. You can go anywhere. I have dozens of pictures like this uh, from Massachusetts to Illinois, uh, all the way out to the West Coast, pretty much always looking the same. You know, these really sad, you know, kind of dull spaces. And this is our static quo, uh, status quo, you know, static, lifeless landscapes that are, as I mentioned before, in the state of arrested development. They lack authenticity. They're repetitive and dull. And as Roy would say, you know, no longer shall we travel from place to place with indifference. We must better understand plants and the relationship to, in order to create landscapes that stir the soul. And I don't know about you, but this certainly does not stir my soul in any possible way. You know, there's hardly any plants there. If you look in the very middle, you know, there's less than 10 of them crammed up at the base of the house. There's no intimacies there. They're all separated in this sea of crushed gravel. And, you know, behind, beyond the time of turf and mulch, plattered plants scattered and lonely at the base of a house. You know, this is a landscape devoid of life. It, I mean, it must start to celebrate the land and not just the house. This may be a yard, but it's certainly not a garden. And our public landscapes, for the most part, aren't doing that much better. This is Grant Park in Chicago. And, you know, this might be an aesthetically distinct place, but it's definitely neither for plants nor people. Uh, and in fact, I've never seen anyone stand there uh, and enjoy that space. People just use it to cut the corner uh, and get from point A to point B a little bit quicker. So I've been thinking a lot about this work for about the past 12 years or so, and it really began uh, when I worked uh, with an urban farm and food justice nonprofit, Growing Power, in the city of Milwaukee 12 years ago. Uh, and there I was the offsite farm manager, uh, and I was in charge of sites like this. We had uh, about a dozen of these farm sites located throughout the city of Milwaukee, and they were on vacant lots that were leased from the city. Um, we had a very generous terms where we could uh, lease these at 10 years a piece for $1 with the purpose of growing food, uh, distributing that food to communities in need, also providing job training. Um, and, you know, it was a wonderful mission, but uh, these sites actually weren't that popular with the communities they were located in. Uh, first off, every site was required to have a fence. Uh, our initial sites had a bit of vandalism at them, so the fences went up and it just became standard practice to put them up. And so when I inherited these sites, the first thing I did was I figured, well, if we want to stop vandalism, we better talk to the neighbors. And so that's what I did. I went door to door and I asked the neighbors, hey, what do you think of this? And it turned out no one had ever asked them before. And in fact, the neighbors hated it. Um, you know, they had no say in this. The city thought they were doing a good thing. They were uh, kind of offsourcing, outsourcing these um, vacant lots that was otherwise their responsibility to an organization that we thought was doing a good thing, growing food, providing it for people in need, providing job training. But no one consulted the people that it affected directly. And you know, what I found out with all of uh, the neighbors is they said, you know, you took away our green space. Uh, we took away something that was beautiful and put up something that's ugly. You know, a hoop house with surrounded by a fence is not a beautiful thing to look at by any means. If you're able to go inside and look inside, of course it's beautiful, even in the middle of winter that's filled with wonderful food. But from the outside, I don't blame them. Yeah, they're right, it is ugly. And we took away that accessibility. That was their accessible green space parks um, that were not maintained uh, and were dangerous to get to because of the roads, or maybe they had a gang um, influence there. Uh, this was a safe place where kids could go outside, they could play freely, and people could keep eyes on them. And we took that away from them, and we never even asked about it. And it really helped me understand the importance of access to green space and beauty um, and realize how important it is to make sure this is accessible to all people. You know, and this is what the neighbors saw in their daily lives. The first thing that was confronted to them was a fence and worse yet, a closed gate, something that implies that some people have access, but they did not. Um, and so we started to try to work with them and beautify these sites. And we grew trees and perennials and we dumpster dove uh, at Home Depot and Lowe's and got fruit trees out of there um, and worked to and try to beautify these landscapes and make them you know, a benefit to the surrounding community. And there was one site in particular uh, that actually really succeeded in this. And that was the partner site that we had with All People's Church. And they understood that. They understood that immediately from the start. And they insisted that if we were going to work with them, we could not put up a fence. That this was for the community uh, to work with directly. 
And there was never any vandalism from the start. The space was always valued. Um, and that's what stimulated those ideas that I described in the previous slides. And once we engaged the neighbors, once we started to beautify the site, once we got them involved, once they had a sense of ownership in these sites, all the vandalism disappeared and they were engaged. They, they said, hey, this is ours. This is a part of our community. And it helped me understand that, you know, okay, we it has to start with beauty. And so I went ahead and went with the person who initially told me that. And that was Roy Diblick. And I had the wonderful opportunity to work with him on a number of projects because he's been doing this work far longer than I have, you know, 30, 40 years at this point. And these were our favorite projects to work on together. You know, yeah, they were sometimes frustrating, um, but this is one of my favorite ones. This is what really started the idea. This is the Lake Geneva Public Library, just south of Northwind Perennial Farm in southern Wisconsin. And I just loved how this otherwise municipal landscape got this beautiful garden and really changed the experience of the space. It welcomed guests year round and it literally brought the, gar the, the library beyond its walls with the garden. You know, libraries are these wonderful, generous places and so are gardens. And so people felt welcome to the space even before they went through the door. And then I realized that all libraries and all public institutions could have gardens like this. And so I began to shift my side work to more projects like this, uh, to get involved with them. You know, and both Roy and I really love them. Um, but unfortunately, in, in his case, you know, these projects don't pay the bills. He did a lot of them as pro bono. And so I decided to take uh, leave Northwind, leave Roy, and make a return to public gardening. Uh, I thought that would be a safe place where I could work to do experiments, to create places of beauty, engage people in progressive gardening practices through education, and hopefully teach, inspire, and lead and encourage others to do the same, to do these projects themselves. And that's what brought me to Chanticleer Garden, where I've been for the past nine years. Uh, you know, and Chanticleer is an amazing, inspiring place. It's known for its create the creativity of the gardeners and their dynamic plantings and artistry. You know, we call ourselves artists in the garden. We're all passionate about what we do. You know, for us, gardening is not simply a job, but it's a calling. You know, and I, I love all of this. I'm inspired by it. But as time's gone on, I've had a deeper and a greater appreciation for our mission. And that's as a pleasure garden. Yes, we're a botanic garden, but first and foremost, we're a pleasure garden. And what that means is it's our goal for everyone to leave in a better mood than the one they arrived in. And I find that very compelling uh, because for too many people, that's a luxury and that should be a necessity in our daily lives. So I asked myself, why are these places so few and far between? Why are these destinations? Why are they limited and reserved for a select few, those who have the privilege of time and resources, and money to be able to go away from their daily lives and enjoy these things? And so I thought, how can we make rich, dynamic and enriching gardens accessible so that all people can experience their tangible benefits directly in their daily lives, especially those people who will benefit from them the most? And so I'm going to talk about two projects I've worked on for the past 10 years, uh, what I call gardens social infrastructure. And I mentioned that when I was at Northwind, I was working with a, uh, I started to work some side projects uh, based on that Lake Geneva Library project. So this is the Elm Grove Library, in my hometown of Elm Grove, Wisconsin, a uh, well-to-do suburb about half hour west of Milwaukee. Uh, and in 2014, they said, hey, you're working with Roy. Why don't you come out and take a look at this? We have this kind of community-run garden. Uh, it was run by volunteers, and it was kind of this collection of plants, you know, no real vision or anything. They said, hey, can why don't we get together and work on this? And so a partnership began and that continues to this day. And so from October of 2014, uh, we changed this entry to the library garden from this to this. Um, and this is in October of 2002. So in less than a decade, we've been able to really change uh, the, the look of this space and it's become a source of pride for the whole community. Uh, the first section, which actually wasn't this one, was planted in uh, spring of 2015. And ever since then, we've undergone a series of continual expansions and they've all been public interest demand, public demand driven. Uh, people are asking for it. The city, the uh, village is asking for it. They're saying, hey, can we expand this? Because it turns out these are a lot more interesting, a lot more beautiful, and a lot less work than the turf and the mulch and everything else that they had previously been taken care of. 
And it's also led to a number of educational opportunities as well. Um, we have signage and classes and talks. There's a plant list on the library website. And currently we're working on creating a series of QR codes to educate people about the garden because so many people engage with it passively. You know, this is a small town. Everyone visits the library at some point. It's attached to the village hall, the police and fire stations. And so people engage with these gardens all the time. And so we have to make sure that they have an education about this no matter when they visit it even if no one is there and then these are positive spaces and they're contagious um and the they're starting to spread throughout the rest of the village as well uh and that's a wonderful and inspiring thing uh and so my involvement with this project led to the next one and that's uh mainline school night here in radler pennsylvania about a mile and a half two miles from where i'm at right now chanticleer garden and Mainline School Night is a nonprofit adult continuing education organization uh, that offers adults of all ages affordable educational experiences to promote the personal enrichment, to promote personal enrichment and to enhance the quality of the community. They have over 800 classes a year. And way back in 2018, they approached Chanticleer and said, hey, it's our 80th anniversary. We'd love to take this kind of sad traffic circle in front of uh, the garden that people parked on and was continuously hit by the plows. And uh, there actually wasn't that much grass there. It was mostly onion grass and, you know, different spring weeds and things like that. A lot of bare soil. They said, hey, can you help us turn this into a new welcome garden for that? And so based on my experience with the library garden, I was selected to do that. And from January 2nd, 2018, we took this space and turned it to that. Now, a little over a year later, this was the, the dedication for that garden. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the time to get it done uh, because they had to repave the um, traffic circle there. So it ended up being a year late after the 80th anniversary. But now it's become this wonderful uh, welcome garden. And I'll outdoor classroom that literally extends the capacity of this organization as an educational continuing learning organization beyond its walls directly into the community. And it's situated in this public park uh, with a dog park in it that has uh, a lot of people engaging with it all the time. And it's such a wonderful way that's benefited not only uh, the people who visit the dog park, but mainline school night as well. So what are gardens uh, as social infrastructure? Um, I was very pleased when I gave this talk at Chicago Botanic Garden a few weeks ago uh, that so many people had heard of the term social infrastructure. Um, it was one, to be honest, I hadn't known about until about five, seven years ago. Um, but it can be something like this, like the Austin, Texas Public Library, where they have these lovely gardens surrounding the building and a very popular rooftop garden as well. And so by definition, to review for those of you who might not be familiar with the term, uh, social infrastructure is the physical places and organizations that shape the way people interact, the physical conditions that determine whether social capital develops. It is the building blocks of public life. And there's examples of it all over the place. Uh, it can be something like the school garden here in the city of Milwaukee that literally brings the mission of nourishing children in the community outside of the walls of the school directly to the community where people, anyone, may interact with it throughout the year, even if the school is not open. And other examples include libraries, parks and athletic fields, pools, schools and playgrounds, sidewalks, green spaces, churches. And I love that last line, neutral spaces of permission. So in general, uh, these are safe havens and third spaces. They tend to be multi-generational and active spaces that facilitate interaction and encourage participation. So this is another project I did uh, with Roy at, at Northland, um, and we did a lot of work at government buildings. This is McHenry Township in Northern Illinois. Um, you know, and every community has government buildings, and, and every person in that community is likely visits this place semi-regularly, and it helps define a sense of place for the community. Uh, I'd include post offices in this as well. Most communities have a post office. You know, there's all these municipal landscapes all over the place, and there's such a wonderful opportunity to improve our communities for the better. And on the other hand, you could look at something like this, like the Barbican in London, the famous landscape done by Nigel Dunnett. Yes, it's high-end housing, but there's also a library, a fire station, and all sorts of other public amenities that are part of uh, this development as well. And it can be churches. This is uh, Bethel AME Church, not far from me here in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. It's a church that I've worked with for a number of years now in their uh, community garden program. And this is their food garden uh, next to the church. And they also have this wonderful program that goes out into the community to those who are interested and helps them develop gardens on their own properties uh, so that they can uh, not only enjoy the benefits of garden, but feed themselves as well. 
And so what are some characteristics uh, of social infrastructure? Um, you know, they're welcoming. These are spaces or gardens of social infrastructure, I should say, is that they're welcoming. They're safe and cared for, like everything we've seen in these slides. And they're ubiquitous and accessible to all ages and abilities and encourage participation by all. And they allow people to engage as peers, uh, supporting social, social cohesion, reducing isolation, and increasing public safety and trust. And that's something that's increasingly important in this day of age. You know, loneliness was recently declared a public health emergency. You know, we increasingly lack face-to-face -face interaction. You know, you no longer uh, interact with someone even at the checkout of a store. It's only with screens all the time. All of this can help improve physical, mental, emotional, and health incomes and reduce feelings of despair. There. And most importantly, they help develop a new and establish a new baseline that then residents and private businesses may expand upon. And so what are some keys to, to creating gardens of social infrastructure? What are some things that I've learned over the past 10 years of doing this kind of work. Uh, and one of those key things is growing slowly. Uh, this is another image of the library garden. And I mentioned it's expanded in phases over the years. Uh, and these were all community demand driven. And so it started with one small section and then it went to another one and then it went to another one and it's expanded seven times. Actually, I believe we're on our eighth expansion now in a little over a decade. And well, why is that key? Well, it allows for success because we're not biting off more than we can chew at any given time. We can get areas established and then proceed and move on. And it maintains interest and builds excitement and enthusiasm, not just to the gardeners, but the community alike. You know, all of us as gardeners know that gardens constantly change and evolve, but for those who, who are uninitiated, you know, they need something a little bit more obvious. And so if you just plant one little garden, you know, people can kind of, you know, get used to it. Go, oh, that's nice. But if it's constantly expanding over time, as this garden did, and as I did with Mainline School Night as well, it's obvious. It's like, wow, they put a whole new thing in over there. Wow, look at that. Look at what they're doing now. And it gets people engaged. It encourages, stimulates individuals' own, curi own curiosity. And then you have to keep growing. You know, as I mentioned, at Elm Grove, we had uh, eight expansions in 10 years. And in Mainline School Night, we had five in five. Uh, An expansion can be a stewardship tool as well. Uh, at Mainline School Night, we expanded the garden in order to reduce weed pressure. Um, and it can also enhance resilience by uh, incorporating more diversity into the overall garden. Then you got to keep growing as well. You don't have to just uh, expand the physical footprint of the garden, but you can add additional complexity within an existing space. That could be like we see here, adding layers of complexity in terms of creating bulb layers or spring ephemerals uh, and expanding that season of interest. And you can do that uh, with a eye towards stewardship and maintenance as well by covering the ground even early in the year, reducing opportunities for those early spring weeds, cool season weeds. Uh, you know, and at Mainline School Night, we've expanded this ball palette every single year. Now people, they know that and they look forward to it. They look forward to seeing what's been added this year, what's new, what's coming up. And it's something uh, that's always something new for people to see and enjoy. And these spaces must be approachable, approachable and welcoming. You know, I mentioned earlier that so many of these landscapes are designed for cars. These are not. Uh, these are designed for people. And you can see here that, you know, it's not that wide of a sidewalk, but this is wonderful, approachable landscape. But it's not boring either. There's still a diversity of heights and textures and colors and forms in it, but it's not overwhelming or intimidating. The plants aren't towering over people. You know, they soften the edges and, you know, they just trail over the edge of the sidewalk. Maybe they'll tickle the ankles of someone coming by, but they're immersive, gentle, and engaging. Uh, and they're dynamic in the composition and the life they support and beautiful throughout the entire year. So how do we accomplish this? Well, it's largely through plant selection and what I refer to as backbone plants. And this is actually a picture of the High Line, uh, something that I think uses uh, what I'm terming backbone plants quite well. You know, the High Line is really not that large of a space. In most places, like we see here, it's the, about the depth of a good-sized border. Uh, and because of that, it has to use this wonderful diversity of plants to maintain interest throughout the entire season. This is in the middle of winter. This was February a number of years ago now, and you can see that even in the depths of winter, this is a beautiful, inspiring, and engaging space, you know, because we're using this wonderful mix of natives and non-natives that 
is always going to vary from site to site, uh, and it's creating interest all throughout the year. Uh, and that's a key thing that I want everyone to focus on. I know people who are here today, uh, you know, even though it's hosted by an organization in Northern Ohio, uh, people might be tuning in from all over the United States. And so I'm not going to give too many plant recommendations because you have to do what works for you. You have to celebrate your own location, your own uh, you know, place. As Lady Bird Johnson said, Maine should look like Maine and Texas should look like Texas. You know, and we want people to celebrate the plants uh, of their specific regions. Um, but the key things are is having a diversity of plants, providing multiple seasons of interest, uh, and then some seasonal interest plants for a little bit of pop. And so we're looking and being inspired by things like plant communities. And even though we're not creating native restorations in these spaces, you know, we could create kind of these novel plant communities as well, these novel ecosystems by pairing plants with similar competitive strategies together, similar growth rates and habits and cultural needs to ensure the success of them and to ensure that they're working uh, wonderfully together in cohesion with each other. Uh, and one of the key things is to make sure you're covering the ground. I mentioned that earlier with the bulbs, and that's an important design element because that's going to reduce maintenance for you. Uh, it doesn't work in every case, but here at the Mainline School Night Garden, you can see early in the year just how dense that is. We have the Amsonia, and then we have Carex beneath that. We have seedlings of penstemons and asters, and here's some bulb foliage over there. You know, and this ground is covered up in mid to late May, so that's reducing opportunities for weeds. And that's adding more structural complexity as well. And because these plants have been cheerfully, uh, carefully chosen and put together, they grow well together. They're not out competing each other. They work really well and create this wonderful closed canopy by mid June uh, that we're able to make even earlier, as I mentioned. You know, sometimes even in May, um, we're incorporating things like biennials and so sowers and using plants as a living mulch. But we also have to make sure that these are simple landscapes. Uh, you know, at Shannon Clear, we're known for our super complex landscapes, but it's because we have full time gardeners taking care of these gardens. And these spaces often don't have that luxury, you know. Um, at the mainline school night and uh, Elm Grove, I only visit those gardens, uh, especially the Elm Grove one, maybe once, twice in a growing season. Otherwise, it's cared for by volunteers the rest of the time. And so by making sure that you know, we have these simple approachable plantings, uh, we're building up the um, kind of... Uh, uh, you know, knowledge and confidence of the volunteers to make sure that they are, are understanding and feeling comfortable in these places. Because if you make something too complex, you know, at the level of a professional gardener for something that is stewarded not by professionals, well, then that's not good. It becomes overwhelming. But we still use these plant communities that work together uh, and create, even though they might be simple, uh, still wonderful, resilient landscapes. But, you know, they're not overly simple either. Not like the landscapes we saw at the very beginning. They still have at least 30 different species. Uh, but they're also, uh, you know, unified uh, you know, aesthetically as well. We can use that through things like repetition. You know, it's not a big jumble of plants. And you can see this here uh, where we have things like the Joe Pye weed, uh, the Calibrogrostis Carl Furster, the Amsonias, the Agastache, the Alliums, the Dyschampsia, repeated throughout this entire planting. It has a sense of movement to it. You know, it makes people feel comfortable in this space. Uh, and, you know, the key, element, the key elements are repeated throughout, makes it a little more approachable, you know, something uh, that's a little bit more comforting uh, to the uninitiated. As I mentioned, this is experienced mostly by people at the dog park. A lot of people who have never even heard of the term public garden. So this might be their first experience, their first engagement with gardens like this. And by making sure it's accessible to them, that ensures that we're building their own curiosity and getting them interested as well. Uh, but even with uh, all of these things, we still want landscapes that are vibrant. You know, we're talking about ecological horticulture, landscapes that nourish biodiversity and are not only aesthetically vibrant, but are full of life as well, that enhance ecosystem services and are as much for all of their life and biodiversity as they are us. They're gardens that empower and nour nourish not only the people who experience them, who care for them, but all other life forms as well uh, by uh, creating a lot of different structural complexity, uh, deadwood, uh, variances in landforms, and all of those things. 
And just like I showed in that backbone plant slide, you know, you have to have plants that have multi-season interest. So we could use something like this Amsonia here, which it comes up and flowers early in the spring, uh, then has a wonderful texture throughout the growing season. And then we can see it again here in the middle of winter, where we still have that little bit of that wonderful vibrant fall color still showing up. Uh, this was taken in December a few years ago. And I love this picture here because uh, it's late, you know, it's in the evening. And I never even thought about this when designing the mainline school night garden uh, but since most classes are during the school year and it gets dark uh, that time of the year you know most people actually experience this space underneath the floodlights in front of the building and so I this wasn't intentional but it was just a lovely thing that it ended up looking so good in the evening hours now uh, as this garden continues to expand that's something that we're keeping in mind uh, and of course we can keep these upright um, and provide the habitat and cover uh, that so many things are going to benefit from them being up all winter long. And then sometimes it's a plant like Allium Summer Beauty. Uh, this is one of the plant that comes up early, clean, green foliage early in the springtime, those wonderful mid-season flowers, those beautiful seed heads that persist uh, throughout the entire winter and that wonderful fall color as well. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken at my in-law's house, a relatively new build subdivision in Southern Wisconsin. Uh, I put this at the front of their house and it's migrated throughout the entire neighborhood. Um, and it's because it's a wonderful approachable plant and people see it and they go, wow, what is that? You know, it looks good all the time and you never seem to be doing anything to it. And so every year, my father-in-law digs it up and shares it with people who come up and ask questions about it. You know, and he's doesn't have to be that much for him, doesn't have to be that much work. And so I love that I'm seeing it uh, in a new place every time I go home and visit them. Uh, and Aster Radon's favorite, Symphia trichum, uh, did the same thing at the library garden. That's one that we're digging up now and sharing with people because it's a plant that just gets people's attention. And it's a wonderful thing because you're stimulating that curiosity and interest. And we can use things like seasonal interest plants. This is mainland school night again, where we use Salvia nemorosa caradana because it blooms right at the time uh, that spring classes are uh, ending uh, at that time of the year. And so as the spring semester comes to a close, you have this beautiful flush of the plants along with the baptisia behind it. Uh, and so we can kind of celebrate these different times of the year. So we celebrate that in the spring. We use aster, radon's favorite again in the autumn here. Uh, and then we have all those wonderful plants that look good throughout the winter as well. And then we can use plants uh, like charismatic megaflora. Uh, I love this term here because it's, you know, so many people, they have plant blindness. Let's be honest. They're not attracted to the plants themselves. But if we use something like Phlox paniculata gina, uh, Perennial Plant Association 2024 plant of the year, it is covered in these wonderful swallowtail butterflies uh, or something like a Vernonia, Vernonia lettermanii summer swan song. It's just covered in a haze of skippers every autumn. And people see that. They say, wow, look at what's attracting all of these butterflies. And so you can get people interested in plants by all the other things that are attracted to them. Or you know, it could be the seed heads in the wintertime that are attracting the birds. All of these wonderful things that are going to just be alternative ways, more opportunities to get people engaged with plants and gardens. And of course, as I mentioned a few times already, winter interest as well. Uh, here's the mainline school night garden in January of last year, still looking good. Uh, and stewardship, I mentioned this at the very start. I like this term a lot better than the term maintenance. And it's how we care for planting. It's our personal way of relating with nature, as Roy would say. And uh, these sites have offered a wonderful opportunity to experiment with different forms of maintenance techniques. Uh, at Mainline School Night, we tried four different ways in four different years. In 2018, we cut the whole thing down with the mulching lower in December. 2019, we cut it back partially, leaving the bottom 12 to 18 inches of the stem, uh, of hollow stems in particular for stem nesting bees. 2020, well, we did nothing because the park it was in was closed because of the pandemic and everything came up just fine. Uh, and in 2021, uh, that's what you see right here where we cut it back with a scythe uh, and then we just left everything in place. All of that material was left there and the garden grew through it just fine. Uh, but our stewardship must be realistic, match not only the site and the plant community that we've established there, uh, but those who are steward who are taking care of it as well. Uh, you know, this is a physical job using the scythe like this. And so if you have people who aren't up to it, uh, taking care of the site, you'll have to modify the techniques that you use. That's a key thing because it's going to vary and there's no correct way of doing it.
And it's an opportunity to, you know, kind of reevaluate how we approach our spaces and our life in general. Uh, you know, disturbance is inevitable in our lives and in our gardens. Uh, and as I mentioned at the start, uh, you know, this former traffic circle was hit with snow plows every single year. Uh, and I'm surprised uh, the garden at Mainland School Night honestly made it this long. If you look closely right here, you, you see we put these boulders around it. Uh, it didn't matter for the plows. They hit them and pushed them anyway. Um, but that's why we incorporated self soil and biennials and all of these wonderful plants that could kind of heal these wounds, plants that thrive on open ground and disturbance. And so this garden is ringed in this dynamic, ever-changing ring of self-sowers that heal the garden itself. And so in autumn, you'll see this wonderful haze of Aragrostis spectabilis, Verbena bonariensis, uh, you know, even things that we would consider weeds like chicory or daucus or things like that, they're going to thrive around the edges, but rarely penetrate into that dense inner layer of the garden. And so that's fine. We can use these rooter and self sowers um, and to occupy the space and reduce those work for us again. You know, and change is good, uh, even if it is stimulated by disturbance. Uh, this is that first section of the library garden. You can see it here. It looked really great. I was super happy with it. Uh, and then a few years ago, the sidewalk that you see in the lower left-hand portion of the screen had to come out. Uh, they had some... Um, drainage issues and so they wanted to pull it out and then actually that was great you know even though this looked good and we had to rip the whole thing up it was an opportunity to expand the space we were able to double the size of the garden uh and now it's even better uh, and this is it uh the day that it was planted a year or two ago and it's a wonderful opportunity to embrace dynamics in our garden uh, and understand the dynamics of our plantings and relate to them in a different way. That's so contrary to what we've talked about at the very start of maintenance, of keeping things in a state of arrested development. You know, our gardens aren't changing. Plants are dynamic. They move around. And we have to learn to embrace them. So it could be so things like these Joe Pye weeds that you see coming up here and that have seeded in along the edge of this path. It could be uh, things like various asters and other things that are seeding in and competing uh, for new place that the planting is evolving and changing um, over time and maybe some short-lived species are starting to you know um, fade out and the longer-lived species are starting to take over um, but that's okay we can always work with these things and that makes the garden interesting because it's changing and evolving with time and it's you know we're always editing with it and it's an opportunity to look at things and determine is this a weed or not a weed uh, you know by the common name joe pie weed well yeah that, that's Sure, that's a weed, but it's also a wonderful native plant. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing. And we have it allows us to appreciate plants in a new way and understand, you know, kind of the cultural history of what led us to labeling them a weed. You know, actually, these plants, um, you know, aren't that much of a problem. They are, as I mentioned, in the case of the plows hitting the edges, they're healing the wounds that we create in the earth. They're fixing our mistakes. You know, these are plants that are adapted to disturbance uh, and, and they're just doing what they're supposed to do. They're covering the earth. And so if we understand them that way, uh, understand how to work with them and we allow them to not overwhelm the planting and it can be absolutely wonderful thing. And we can look at uh, these kind of plants that are traditional weeds and actually maybe have a new appreciation appreciation for them. This is prickly lettuce. Uh, and look at how beautiful that is. Look at the architectural structure of it. Look at the distinction of that leaf as it comes up. You know, and this is a wonderful thing because it comes up, it's brilliant, it looks great, and we never let it go to seed. Uh, as soon as it's about to go to seed, we cut that off uh, and we don't worry about it. We just don't let it continue to persist in the garden. But it's also a sign of success because what brings it back in every single year? Birds and other wildlife. And that's a good thing. This garden was partially designed for the benefit of birds. And so it, that's a sign of success. If birds are bringing weed seeds in, well, that means you have a garden that's good for birds. And this is one of their favorite things to bring in is pokeweed. It's a beautiful architectural plant and it's very important for birds. Uh, Co-evolved with them and it's high in carbohydrates and protein. It provides the energy when migrating birds need it in the fall. And uh, Jenkins Arboretum, not far from us here at Chanticleer, considers it one of the top 10 fruit plants for birds in the landscape. And, you know, they bring it back every year. So I can consider it as kind of a thank you from them. And all of this has to do with uh, adjusting our tolerance and preferences for landscapes. These are, you know, these gardens of social infrastructure are not meant to be a perfect garden. You know, if you look at this closely, you're going to see a lot of weeds in there. You know, this would be a very unacceptable at Chanticleer. But here's the thing is 
No one notices them. As I mentioned, people are coming to that dog park every single day, but their eyes are attracted to the plants that are blooming, that are creating, you know, that are familiar to them or grabbing their attention, maybe a seasonal interest plant. And then if something does come up and it does catch your eye because they've trained it a little bit more, then, well, that's an opportunity for them to learn. And they can look at that and say, hey, that is a prickly lettuce. Hey, that is something, but this is how we're managing it in this landscape. This is how we can uh, coexist with these plants here without having them over overwhelm us. And so even though it does look a little rough around the edges from time to time, that's fine. And that's important because we do have to go ahead and adjust our tolerances and preferences because here we are in a time of climate change and we don't know how these dynamics are going to play out. This is Bainline School Night this past summer and we had that horrible air pollution from the wildfires up in Canada that came down and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how something like air pollution is going to affect our plantings. How are they going to be able to stand up to it? Uh, yeah, and the big, the key thing is, is just making sure we have resilience plants. You know, we have to work with their dynamics and understand that we're not going to have a perfect garden all the time. And it's going to change from year to year. And we need to embrace that. And here was a year, this was a few years back. This is uh, mainland school night in the summer of 2002. We had a horrible drought that year. And here you can see everything going dormant very early in the season. I forget this is uh, maybe late July or early August here. You can see the Joe pie weeds are already senescing. So this is Achillea gold plate. That's drying out. Uh, the golden rods have flowered earlier than normal. Um, but the flip side of this was uh, the Amsonias had the most vibrant fall color that they ever had. And so, you know, it doesn't mean that all, everything's bad with this. Sometimes we have these wonderful new things come up that we didn't even realize were a possibility previously. And this garden has never been watered. Uh, after the initial planting, uh, we watered everything in, and then it simply relies on rainfall after that. And that's so key if we want to create these resilient landscapes of the future. And part of that is because of the diversity of plants that we have, because diversity equals resilience. You know, if we want to have these landscapes that are going to change and grow with us uh, in an era of climate change, we need to make sure uh, that they're able to change and adapt uh, to all the unexpected things that might be coming their way. We need to build that in with them through the resilient plant palettes that we have. And as I mentioned, as Roy said, it all begins with beauty. And so this is, you know, there's no reason we can't have landscapes like this all over the place. Uh, this is a project I did a number of years ago for a private client when I was working at Northwind. Uh, and all they asked for was a beautiful landscape around their back patio. Uh, and so we put this in, a wonderful mix of native and non-native plants. Um, and then as soon as that went in, all of a sudden, the threatened butler's garter snake decided to move in and make it its home. And then the client became really interested in it went, wow, this is threatened garter snake. This is so cool. And now they have an interest in habitat. And it all started because they were interested in beauty. That's all they wanted was a beautiful landscape. And now they have an interest in biodiversity and wildlife. And although the client no longer lives uh, at this site, they've moved to a new one. Now I'm working with them uh, and their new condo development uh, to create a soft landings uh, landscape plan uh, that they can implement throughout the community that they live in now. So it starts with beauty and we have to expand beyond what we have right now because this is our current baseline. Uh, this is the Ohio Welcome Center along the uh, highway there. Uh, sorry, Ohio. <laughs> I don't mean to, uh, you know, this is uh, throw, throw any shade on you guys. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I'm sure the state of Ohio would love to make a better impression and all the people coming through so we can move beyond that and go from the current baseline to a better one. You know, so how do we make these rich, dynamic and plant, uh, ditch, rich, dynamic, enriching plantings ubiquitous? Well, we create a better baseline. We build interest. We encourage engagement with them. We can make these landscapes all over the place, establishing new baselines, not only for beauty, but ecology and community that then individuals and private com and commercial entities may expand upon. Baselines that celebrate health and resilience and encourage positive change in all communities uh, and you know, engage with these stakeholders, not only in the sense of the buildings uh, and the organizations directly, but people uh, who we didn't expect to be stakeholders initially. As I mentioned with Mainline School Night, the people who visit the dog park are the most engaged audiences because they see it frequently. And they're the ones who are going through there. And if they know what they're doing, they're pulling weeds and they're picking up litter. And I've never found dog poop in this space 
just because people care for it. They feel a sense of ownership with it. You know, they're engaged uh, in that space. And the key is, is getting frequency, you know, making sure that we're making these gardens ubiquitous and putting them in front of people in all communities all the time, because people can walk by these places. You know, it's not a destination. They can walk by a village hall or a library or a post office and engage with the space and see it. And they go, oh, aha, look at it. It's there. And it makes it more approachable and accessible. And someone can look at this. This is in front of the village hall. And I'm groving and go, I can do that. No one's ever taken care of that. Oh, I know that plant. I can incorporate that. I never thought, look at how densely it's planted. Boy, maybe I need to, uh, you know, change the way I'm doing things instead of covering everything in mulch and separating them apart, uh, you know, apart for airflow. I can do something like this. And then that frequency also allows us to counter uh, narratives, you know, with, when it comes to private homeowners and businesses, you know, we have all of these wonderful organizations and initiatives like Homegrown National Park, and that's wonderful, but it kind of only engages the early adopters, and then it allows people to tell their own stories. This is Jeff Epping of Oldbrook Botanic Gardens, Frank Garden, uh, and, you know, it's limited. Uh, only the people on his street really see this, uh, and people adopt it, and they, they like it, and that's great, but Equally as so, in my hometown, I had someone put in, a neighbor put in a prairie garden about 20 years ago, and people develop their own narratives, and they go, boy, that person, you know, they're pretty crunchy, or boy, they're kind of this native plant nut, or ah, they're un-American because they don't have a lawn, uh, and so we can counter that by making these landscapes a part of our everyday environments. People go, oh, you know what, boy, if, if the municipality is doing that, if the school's doing that, maybe I can do that too, and they can see the benefits of them and adopt them themselves. Uh, and of course, we have to go through a great unlearning, uh, you know, as you saw at the very beginning from volcano mulching to all of these other poor practices, we have to demonstrate through these spaces how we can do things differently. And here is Achillea gold plate, never been cut back in mainline school night garden, grows through it every single year. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing that we can show people directly that, hey, you don't have to do this and uh, there's a different way. And there's so many missed opportunities. You know, opportunities are all over the place. Uh, this is at a university in Kansas City uh, and universities all over and schools all over the United States. These are the landscapes that people see. These are the landscapes that our young people are seeing. And you know what? They're not interesting. They're not inspiring. It's never going to engage young people and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna do this for a living. I could do that. How are we gonna inspire the next uh, generation? Uh, there's a sign at a university not so, too far from here at Chanticleer. Uh, they have it all over their campus, and it says, young people want to change the world. And I agree with that. But if this is what they're seeing every single day, they're not going to do that through plants and gardening. And that's what we need to do moving into the future. Of course, we also have the failure of good intentions. This is a biosway in Minneapolis. Uh, and there's probably as much litter in there as there are plants. And we need to do better. You know, if people see this, then they think, green infrastructure and all these other initiatives are just a waste of time, money, and resources. We need to show people successes so that they can build upon them. Upon them, we need bioswales that look like this, and this is the bioswales that Claudia, Claudia West did in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we're doing an okay job of it in some places. At our cultural institutions, like the Field Museum that you see here, uh, zoos, aquariums, the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, you know, we're leading by example, and there's all sorts of people who are doing this. Uh, at cultural institutions, Kelly Norris at the Iowa Opera, Rebecca McMacken at the Brooklyn Museum, uh, but these are still destination gardens, and we need to make these landscapes, these rich, dynamic, enriching gardens ubiquitous. Uh, when I spoke at Chicago, I used their unofficial mo or, you know, their motto, herbs and horto, city in a garden. Uh, you know, we need to create our cities turn our cities into gardens and you know, gardens shouldn't be destinations. They should be the places we live. They should be part of our everyday environment. And this is another North Wind project, another Roy Project project, the city of Fontana or village of Fontana, their village hall, uh, you know, places where people can experience it in their everyday lives. And people are doing this. Ben O'Brien did it at a library in, entire, in an Ontario, Canada, and Roy's doing it all over Southern Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. Uh, but we need, also need to work with, you know, where we are right now. I'd love to move beyond a time of cars, but you know, parking lots are still dominating our places. And so uh, we need to work to create these wonderful parking landscapes. Uh, this is a Morton Arboretum outside of Chicago and they have these rich bioswales. And look at how interesting and vibrant that is. And it's humming with life, even though it is in the middle of a parking lot. Uh, I love visiting it. It really sets the tone for everyone who enters the rest of the Arboretum at that point. Uh, and it absorbs stormwater, provides habitat, provides all sorts of wonderful ecosystem services.
and opportunities abound. Every community has numerous sites of social infrastructure, numerous opportunities on publicly owned and managed spaces. And you know, we can encourage stakeholders uh, because you know, all of you can do this wherever you see opportunities. Obviously, someone's already done that here. This is a library uh, in community in Narberth, just east of where I am at Chanticleer. Someone's clearly gardened this little planting bed here, but it'd be great if they would expand it out here under the lawn. I can guarantee you the municipality will not miss mowing underneath it. They'll be happy to give it up. Um, but you, know, you also need more than just individuals. It needs to be a team effort, uh, people coming together and gardening the space. And here we have the library, the VFW post. People are visiting these spaces all the time. So this is a wonderful opportunity to create a new baseline uh, that can then start encourage positive change throughout the rest of the community. And we have things like this, these ditches all over places. This is a ditch in uh, my hometown of Elm Grove. We could change it from this to that. This is the Bioswale that Roy Dippick did at Cantini. Here's a project I did in Southern Wisconsin a few years back. Uh, this was some private land. This was a really steep ditch and we changed it from this to that. Um, and you know, people, it, it encourages change. And this was grant funded and that was a wonderful way to do it. The grants bought the plants, but it needs to be more than just grants for funding these types of projects because a grant is not gonna support long-term extended stewardship. And that was something that the urban agriculture uh, movement, when I was working with it, we always ran into a problem of constantly chasing money. And so we have to make sure that if we're doing this type of work, we have sustainable funding to support it. And uh, forest preserves, especially in Illinois, are doing a great job of it. DuPage County Forest Preserve is a line item in their taxes. Uh, and these are wildly popular things. Cook County Forest Preserve, which Chicago Botanic Garden is a part of, they just had a referendum to increase their funding, and that passed with over 60% approval. So these are widely popular things. We just need to make sure that we're approaching it in the right way to get that public and municipal buy-in on these types of projects. And this can be applied to any community because all communities have all sorts of existing sites of social infrastructure in them. This is my hometown of Elm Grove, Wisconsin, as I've talked about numerous times. You can kind of see the outline there. We're fortunate to have the village park right in the center of town, uh, right there. And then I mapped out the potential sites of social infrastructure here. Green is uh, municipally owned land, whether that's the park, the boulevards, um, stormwater retention areas, school, public school grounds, um, right of ways for um, stream corridors and things like that. Uh, the orange is a rail line that passes through town. The purple uh, are pedestrian pathways uh, along the sides of roads that have potential bioswales and other things. And the yellow are our nonprofit partners, churches primarily. And you can see how very quickly we occupy a great amount of land in an already existing built up environment. And so there is a lot of land mass available to create rich dynamic enriching plantings in our built communities. And so we can realize things like the 3030 initiative right where people live, right where it will directly benefit people instead of only conserving far away places that people won't see. You know, that doesn't translate to the general public if they say, oh great, you know, we conserved another plot of land somewhere out west. That's wonderful. You know, and yeah, those are good things. We, we should be doing that as well. But we need to provide these benefits where the people will experience them themselves. And it doesn't mean these places are fully garden, but every one of these sites is an opportunity to bring more people a face to face interaction with gardens and each other. It can happen in any zip code. Uh, this is the 53206 zip code uh, in the north uh, north side of Milwaukee. It's a community I'm quite familiar with. Uh, before I came into horticulture, I was uh, a went to public education. I did my student teaching right there uh, at the bottom of the screen. And then when I worked in urban agriculture, we had a farm site right here. Um, and so I spent a number of years in this community. Uh, and this is a community that has been syst um, systematically and systemically disenfranchised. Uh, in 2020, it had the highest incarceration rate of any zip code in North America. And it's unfortunate because it was once a thriving middle class um, dominantly black community. Uh, the street you see over here on the side, right side of the screen, uh, Martin Luther King Drive, uh, had the highest rate of black owned businesses east of the Mississippi uh, at one point. Up here, we had the American Motors Company, uh, which was a wonderful employer, provided thousands of jobs, and this was a thriving community. And then 
freeway went in. And it was put here on purpose to separate the uh, thriving business sector from where everyone worked. And then we had deindustrialization and the American Motors plant shut down. And to no fault of anyone who lived there, all of a sudden, uh, this became you know, a community that was really hard up on themselves. There weren't jobs there. Uh, they were separated from their, their centers of community. And you know, this was something that led to all sorts of social ills, uh, rising crime rate and all of these other things. All of this can be uh, helped to be ameliorated with gardens of social infrastructure. So let's look at the mapping of this here. So uh, in the middle, we have the cemetery, and then in orange, we have the schools. And I consider the cemetery as an opportunity for social uh, gardens of social infrastructure as well. So now we have schools in orange, then we have churches uh, in yellow, we have community gardens uh, in green, and these are community gardens that are actively managed by nonprofits, not including private or neighborhood garden plots. Uh, and why is this important? Well, it's because vacant lot greening reduces gun violence by 29%. This is a result that uh, was studied right here in Philadelphia by the Urban Health Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And that is an outstanding statistic. What a huge difference. By nearly a third, you know, we can reduce gun violence simply by vacant lot greening. I mean, this is outstanding. You know, we listen to the news every day and we hear about, you know, tenth of a percentage change in the stock market. And people get excited about that. But 29% reduction in gun violence simply by vacant lot greening, we need to adopt this all over the place. And we can use connecting corridors. These are uh, existing boulevards and streets that are way too wide for what they need to be. And we can redesign these and create bike lanes and opportunities for pedestrians to connect all of these different places together. And if we combine them, all of that green, look at how quickly we can uh, change a blighted, disenfranchised neighborhood and make it not so bleak. You know, these are all possibilities. Every single one of these pieces of green here is an opportunity to get the benefits of gardens directly to the people who need it most. Uh, and this is not even including vacant lots. So that vacant lot greening stat, that would include, uh, I'm working on the slide for that right now, and that increases it to well over a third, almost, you know, like 40% of the land mass in this community is an opportunity to create rich, dynamic, enriching planting to benefit the people who live there. And that's right now, it can happen right now. We don't have to do much of anything. And that doesn't mean it's permanent either. You know, these gardens can be temporary. They can change with time. And if it creates new opportunities for development, well then fine. You know, it does. it's much better to have a garden there now providing the benefits today than sitting around and waiting and saying, well, that might be developed someday and then just having a blighted vacant lot in the meantime. Let's get gardening right now. We need to do that in order to create cooler, quieter and help healthier environments to help mitigate the negative effects of sprawl, to create more shade, to decrease the heat island effect, more permeability to decrease runoff, increase biomass for greater carbon storage, increase plant and structural diversity for increased biodiversity, more habitat for more potential conservation opportunities, more and greater diversity of plants for less air, water, noise, light, and legacy pollution opportunities for natural connection. You know, so many of us are disconnected from the natural rhythms of our world. You know, I'm lucky. I get to see the sunset rise and set most days, hear the chorus of spring peepers and the migration of the birds tuned into the seasonal rhythms. But so many people lack those opportunities and people are suffering for it to create opportunities and places for healing. You know, uh, everyone deserves a place that's comfortable, a place to heal and simply be. After 9-11, people came to Chanticleer all the time not knowing why. They just felt like it was a good place to be. People flocked to public gardens in times of need, in times of stress. Uh, and throughout the pandemic, we saw that a lot. Uh, you know, as our visitorship, even with the garden being closed for the first part of the year, uh, we set a record attendance that year. But, you know, this is still a destination. We need to make these opportunities available in people's everyday lives to create places for gathering. Uh, Mainland School and Garden, again, this was the only place that we felt comfortable enough to having an in-person class during the pandemic because people felt comfortable enough to be outside in the garden. And we're creating places of community, places of increased social cohesion that allow for improvements to not only individual, but community well-being, community resilience and flourishing are nurtured. And gardens are essential components of public space because they allow people to comfortably engage as peers, providing these neutral spaces for permission and opportunities for people to confront their differences and find common ground through face-to-face -face interaction. You know, and these gardens embrace complexity and diversity in a, land, in a complicated world where we all 
all too often resort to oversimplified binary solutions. We need to celebrate diversity as essential to healthy gardens and healthy societies. If we're going to change the world, it will only happen through community. And we need to have these communities in order to support each other uh, in order to make up for any of our weaknesses. And you know, a community that strives to, good, to do good individually and together, to grow, evolve, and improve. Uh, and this is a garden that I did, uh, my apartment uh, before I came to live at Chanticleer a few years back. Um, this went in just in time for the pandemic and it became the neighborhood meeting place. It also became a, a place to meet uh, for people who had never even been there before. Uh, and during the protests in the summer of 2020, uh, in response to the murder of George Floyd, uh, it became a meeting place for a local rally. Um, it wasn't intended to be that, but people came there and they said, meet at the garden. And that was such an important thing. We need to create these third places to help foster that social co cohesion and reduce isolation and those feelings of hopelessness and despair. You know, parks already do this, but if we can create more gardens of social infrastructure at other places, you know, that just expands the opportunities because these places have a positive presence in our daily lives, a positive engagement and a constant benevolent presence in hectic daily lives that can promote and lead to healthier lifestyles, encourage positive physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual outcomes, and even aid in developing people's capacity for empathy uh, by fostering those connections, reducing acute stress, and subsequently reduce diminishing crime and violence. Um, and then it all allows for intergenerational connections. You know, I mentioned at the very start of this, the importance of mentors, but how are we going to share our love of plants with the next generation? I mean, it has to start sooner than our college campuses. Uh, you know, we need parents and grandchildren and older caregivers, even if it's not the kids themselves, to engage the next generation, to encourage them to be involved and develop their love and curiosity of nature and the outdoors. You know, altering notions of pristine and wildness and appreciating all of this variety of landscapes uh, beyond the ways that we're currently experiencing them. I believe there's a huge opportunity for public gardens in this to move beyond their fences and get out to the community, get out into the community themselves to lead, uh, you know, with the knowledge and experience that public gardens have. And Denver Botanic is doing a wonderful job with it, where their gardens have literally spilled over the fence into the community and on both sides of this road uh, and along the sidewalk where people can interact with it on a daily basis. Uh, Ulbrich Botanic is doing this in Madison, Wisconsin, and they did that before when Jeff Edving was there, where they took their gravel gardens and moved them to parks and community centers throughout the city of Madison. Uh, and here's Monona Terrace, also in Madison, Wisconsin. And I love this space because it's downtown, it's accessible, it's walkable to a number of citizens and all the students at the University of Wisconsin campus. You know, Oldbrook's further away. Many public gardens are further away. You need to take transportation to get to them or you need to drive. But here, uh, this space is open, accessible, free, 363 days a year, weather dependent. And it's a rich, dynamic, enriching space, lovingly gardened by Tony Gomez Phillips because social infrastructure provides an accessible escape and a glimpse of a better reality, it provides for the collective effervescence in our societies. And while there's so many things that we're struggling to fix in our world today, violence, crime, climate change, you know, we're not gonna fix all of these, but by creating gardens all over the place, we can help ameliorate these conditions at far less cost than the solutions that we've tried so far because we're creating landscapes that empower and inspire. And people should feel empowered by the world and especially for our future generations, the world they will inherit. As Eric Kleinenberg, who's written a lot about uh, social infrastructure says, our infrastructures reveal uh, who we were at the time, who we, our infrastructures reveal who we were at the time we built them and what we aspired to become. And so, you know, with that, I ask, uh, what do we want to do in our world moving forward? And in order to do that, we need to get gardening. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the uh, kind of extended uh, overtime here, <laughs> dealing That's with a okay, cold. Chris. So uh, uh, <laughs> I'm going to pop in a cough drop right now. Yeah, was, it was my voice is wonderful, failing. wonderful <laughs> presentation. Very inspiring, Chris. Thank you so much for um suffering through your cold there and presenting for Not us a problem. Today. Thank you for having me. It's been pretty I mean, I, I will share the chat with you after this, and I think you'll see that everyone um, was um, very impressed with your message. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I am going to throw a handful of questions at you since we have a little bit of time here. And Certainly. I had a couple of them were kind of interesting. So, um, right. you know, you showed a lot of public gardens, um, and very few of them had trees, even small ones. Um, given global warming, wouldn't shade um, be more beneficial is the question. 
Oh, I absolutely think we need to have more trees, certainly. Uh, and but it, it's going to depend on what the goal of that space is. Uh, you know, I mentioned backbone plants, and sometimes in some of the especially more urban spaces where not everyone is going to have the opportunity to plant a huge tree because they have a small plot of land. Well, then how can we maximize species diversity, structural complexity through smaller trees or shrubs uh, and all of these other things, perennials especially. Um, and so it's about maximizing the diversity of plants in all forms. But yeah, we we certainly okay. need a lot more trees in our landscape. And I encourage people to plant them. And um, as you said, small trees, start by planting them small. Actually, in some of these landscapes, there were trees there. You just couldn't see them because we started them from seed. Um, and see. so with time, they're going to um, definitely change the space. And then that's another reason for why we have uh, dynamic plant palettes so that uh, they can change and respond to that increasing shade on their own. And, and here's one last question for you. When you were talking about the school, um, you mentioned sure. four different cutback methods. Did you mm -hmm. find one that works best um, for growth as well as the effort you put into um, removing? Boy, honestly, um, I'm kind of partial to when we did nothing in 2020 because we couldn't. <laughs> uh, that is definitely uh, the lowest form of maintenance um, because we did absolutely nothing. Um, but, you know, that comes back to tolerance and preferences. And in many situations, that is not going to be acceptable but it's also an opportunity to show people sorry i have my cough drop in uh these other you know uh, new ways of doing things and i hope one day these those styles of stewardship will become you know more prevalent in our daily lives we don't need these neat tidy landscapes everywhere um and of course from a biodiversity perspective that's certainly going to provide better results so Personally, yeah, that was the one uh, I liked the best. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Chris and Mark, for presenting today. If we did not get to um, your question today, please know that we will answer them offline. I want to remind everyone that we'll be back on Thursday, February 29th with another afternoon of talks. Um, we will be welcoming Don Davis, the author of The American Chestnut and Environmental History, and Joan Maloof the offer of Nature's Temples, A Natural History of Old Growth Forest. So please register for this session today. And thank you again, Mark and Chris, and wishing everyone a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks.